okay, <laughs> that banking gets assigned. But given that we will have to have the banking bill out and the insurance bill, we're going to walk through. We are bringing it on the agenda again today. Uh, we'll walk through the banking bill, the draft. I assume it's pretty Michael, close mm -hmm. to the final. Sure. And then we Thank will you. be ready. And I'm just hoping that this will stay as housekeeping as they have in the past. And hopefully when it comes in. You'll understand. I know. I'm going to do. I thought the insurance bill was a little <laughs> bad. Oh, <yeah. laughs> okay. So let's start with a, a walk-through with Molly and okay. introduce who's Yes, here. I'm Molly Dillon, Deputy Commissioner of DFR for Banking, and this is Amy Richardson, and she's the Director of Regulatory and Consumer Affairs. And she works with our, our licensees often, so she's going to need to explore further explanation or notice that you will <laughs> Don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but what we'd like to do today, because it is a very, it is thick, it is um, thick. I'd like to give you an overview of what we are trying to accomplish and hopefully um, be able to assuage um, any concerns about us the size, because it's, what we're really doing is consolidating and um, reorganizing a number of bills that today live one after the other after the other okay. in the statutes with lots of um, common components. Okay. All right. If I hear gasping from Ms. Medelia, I Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, no, maybe we've gone beyond housekeeping. <laughs> yeah. So well, um, we did speak with um, a number of indus uh, industry uh, people who might have had interest in this, and hopefully there will be no gasping. Okay. <laughs> I, know, I know we have some interest in one section of the insurance bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with insurance. So we'll okay, let's go. Okay. So mostly this is, as I said, kind of a consolidation and reorganization of um, um, Chapter 72. Um, and I thought, uh, and I also wanted to thank you for letting us do the overview since we haven't had a bill and we don't have a number yet. Um, so we believe we're taking probably 70 or 80 pages out of the statutes by making this combination because of the way it lists everything today separately. Um, and that um, thanks to David Hall, some of the other changes that look like they're new, which are under, all underlined when you see the bill, are because of changing, the, modernizing the language. So there's not a lot of changes in the language, but a lot of um, making it much easier to read, and I wanted to thank him for um, doing that. For, uh, I think that will help us. Um, so uh, I'd like to just uh, share something about to try to describe what we're doing. Um, we, I um, was involved with uh, six people moving into an apartment. And of course, we all came with our stuff, six sets of dishes, six sets of silverware, and towels, and pots, and pans, and some decorations and then my clothes and that stuff. And what we had to do was figure out what we were going to use in this park because we certainly weren't going to use it all. So we figured out what all the common things were that, we, that would go like in the kitchen or somewhere common that we were all going to use, sort that all out. Um, we knew what we had. We were going to have the same dishes, the same silverware, the same everything. And then there was all separately, uh, Bathroom, so two of us shared a bathroom, so two of us had some smaller common things. And then, of course, I have my own toothpaste, and I'm not sharing that with anybody. Mm -hmm. So what we did was approach this as putting together all the common area elements, and then breaking down the specific pieces for the different kinds of license types. And let, let me just say, this is about our licensing regime. It's not about our banking or credit union parts of Title VIII. It's just about the licensing regime with a few things at the end that I'll talk to specifically that are almost technical changes for some of the banking pieces. But the bulk of this is about how we license um, lenders, debt adjusters, and so on. So, this says that this bill is 131, and that was my mistake. I, I, made, I thought that that was something else, and Faith has a corrected copy. 
um, this to, to give you. And this is the beginning, page one. So you can see here, this is kind of what I described. We took the blue parts of every one of these sections and have combined them into a general section under this regulation or this statute uh, request. These statutes um, go through the same thing over and over again because we use a common licensing regime uh, and MLS. We've used that for over 11 years. And every time we've added a, a lending license type or one of these categories, much of that uh, language was just repeated again and again. I think I remember reporting most. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps this is true. <laughs> I do remember the I do remember the bills. And so we took all that common language, mm -hmm. then we added specifics that applied only to certain things. So there's some specific, specific things around, for instance, litigation funding, because it's a different animal than a mortgage and has some different requirements um, with us. So I mean that's the whole concept with what we started with. And then, um, so I want, does anybody have any questions on this side of the chart? And these are the categories that we're talking about. Lenders, loan, loan services, mortgage brokers, commercial lenders, sales finance companies, debt adjusters, loan solicitation companies, money services businesses, and litigation funding companies. So they all have the same common element. And so then on the other side of this sheet, I wanted to show you that the bulk of all of this is the common denominator of pulling all these together and then listing the specifics. We didn't just, uh, we did feel that we should look at the licensing and make changes that we found necessary since some of these licenses are newer, some things have changed over time, uh, some things we think would make it work a little bit better for us. Um, the language part has, will be very much better for industry, we believe. Um, and so you'll see there's a light blue section for what we changed within the licensing regime. And then, as I mentioned, there are a few changes in the rest of Title VIII that are in the green section. And that makes up the bulk of the bill. The common sections are the first 40 pages of the bill. The green section, the, the other section, is only 11 pages at the end. And as we go through it, you'll find that very much in the middle of that is line out, strike out, strike out, strike out, so that you can see what got moved, but that in the end, we expect that the bill will look something like a much smaller bill. 70 pages. Maybe. Much smaller. Much set smaller. Of regulations. Right. And when we started with this, looking at all the sections that were being deleted, um, it was well over 170 pages. So um, we've really done some, I think, work on making it streamlined. So um, if there are no questions on the concept, I thought I would go over some of these. Um, particulars we're changing, mm -hmm. um, but I will, but I will start with the the darker blue. You can see that this looks like the, the kinds of things that are in every section: the common definitions, the application process, places of business, um, notice of material change. These are all things that we ask these licensees to tell us that are required to tell us about, so that there cannot be bait and switch and that kind of thing. What happens with revocation or surrender, what our penalties are, um, that we can do joint exams and annual reports and the confidentiality. So all of that seems to kind of all go together in addition to being what's in each of those bills. It actually makes sense when you look at this way, I think. But then if I can start with the um, light blue section, um, we um, added some of these changes intent with our intention to kind of harmonize a few of the small, a few of the individual licensees with this general 
with this general uh, approach to a um, single way of looking at the licenses. So um, these five things are changes within the blue area, within the licensing regime, um, identifying an abandoned application. So that means that we get somebody who applies to us and they don't finish the application and it can sit there and sit there and sit there. And um, it affects our uh, performance evaluation on how long it takes to get an evaluate, uh, to approve a license. And um, we have sort of uh, accreditation for licensing that um, this affects. So we would like to be able to call those abandoned after 90 days. And that is different than revoking or terminating, which has some bad connotations in the licensing industry. So it's just adding a way to um, identify those that and this happens, that people start an application and then just don't finish it. Maybe they get all wound up about so applying in California, <laughs> okay. something like that. Whatever reason, but you've got a partial application you can't proceed on. We're waiting for them. You're waiting for them, but after so long, it starts to impact your grading. Yes. Right, and it would only be, if I may add, when they haven't communicated with us. So there okay. are some times where they might start the application and we're going back and forth with requests for further information. information. And if they're staying in touch with us and, and still being actively involved in it, we would not okay. deem it abandoned unless we, we just can't reach them anymore. They're not responding to any of the things okay. that we need and we don't want it to affect our accreditation. So they send it in, you say, we need a copy of your bank statement mm -hmm. and it doesn't come and it doesn't come and they don't answer your phone right. um, or emails or that or whatever else then at, after 90 days you say okay mm -hmm. and they'll have to start over they'll have to reapply mm -hmm. update anything they've sent us okay okay the next is to change the three-year exam period for loan solicitation. Um, we do a couple of these uh, debt adjusters and money services business we do on a risk basis. We would like to move that to a risk basis, which is in the language, so that if we saw that there was something that needed to be attended to quickly, we could, uh, the commissioner have the authority to ask for an exam. But if there's nothing going on with that, we can attend to things that have a bigger risk factor, and we have not had any kinds of increases in concerns or complaints about this, this category. So we'd like to move this to this space. Yes. Very good, yes. Um, the third one is really um, a detail. We are changing where we use stored value in the bill, in the statutes. We want to change that to prepaid access because that's the word that is used by um, FinCEN, the um, Financial Crimes um, Oversight part of the U.S. Treasury. Okay. And many of the states use prepaid access. So these companies that are applying in all 50 states um, are used to that word. We didn't change our definition of that at all, so it's just a word substitution. What page are you on? Oh, sorry. right here. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I'm the back. You're on this. Yeah, I'm yeah. yeah. oh, sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. Yeah. I'm just going through the changes within licensing. Got it. So. And if anybody wanted to, I have the exact pages for each of these changes. No problem. Nope. So, I don't have any problem with that change because I don't know what either of those terms mean. So, um, <laughs> it's used in reference to um, gift cards, gift certificates. A debit card is a prepaid okay. access card. And um, under our definition, could include cryptocurrency. Ooh. Ah, uh -huh. wow. 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 Right. Now you got our attention. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, and like Molly said, it's not changing the definition. It's a virtual currency will remain within there. It's just changing what we call it instead of um, instead of stored value. It will now be prepaid access, which is is. Broadly known as it's the more current term of art. Correct. Um, the next one is that we have uh, we have some changes to our money services business, um, and I'll just go over those quickly. And this has come from this is another um, kind of license that's that's kind of new, but we see a lot of activity in this. 
And so we feel that some of these things need to be added to make our um, license regime a little bit stronger. Um, one of them is uh, there are four things we've added, which I didn't, I thought the page would go on forever. So we are added, we've added three exemptions that are very common in the industry. One is the agent for payee, one is a payment processor, and one is uh, other state independent trust companies. And all of these, these three exemptions uh, either have legal, a legal, a legal, a legal requirement that um, someone takes on responsibility for a process, doesn't include actual control of the money, or in the case of the independent trust company, they are under a, a regulatory regime that's probably even more strenuous than the one we would have when we examine them. So these are um, exemptions from being licensed if you are a agent for the payee. So what that means is that if I hire an agent to pay something for me, they accept responsibility to make sure that's paid. It's not that they're a pass-through and they're controlling my money for a while. So by, that, by contract, they've accepted that responsibility to make sure the payment is made, and that's in contract law. Was that an individual? Are we talking companies? Companies. This so company. there's an example. Uh, right now? Um, ADP. Oh, ADP. So, so uh, when you, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. scary. So, so when you, when, um, I know PayPal. Yeah, I, yes. That would, that, um, they, they control more of the money. But in the case of ADP, they accept responsibility for making payments to their, to the employees for a company and for paying the taxes that are due. And they, their legal contract binds them to pay that, so it's off okay. the employer. Okay, so this would be like a payroll company. Yes, that okay. would be one example. So they would, they don't have the employer's money that's in the bank, but they write a check on they behalf have, of the employer and send it to the employees plus to take the taxes and remit the taxes to the state and the <coughs> federal government? Um, they actually have the money, oh, they but have they them. also have the legal responsibility to pay those funds out to someone else, and okay. they can't keep them. Okay. The licensing regime around that would be to make sure somebody doesn't say, I'm gonna go pay your taxes, and you give me the money, and I don't mm -hmm. pay it, and I take off to Canada. Okay. It, it avoids that. But where there's this legal contract, we feel that um, that covers the consumer. And there are other examples of companies who may do this payment processing for like your utility bills. So mm -hmm. instead of you taking the time to write your own check or go into your online banking and set that up, there are companies that do that on behalf of consumers. And, and as Molly said, there's a contractual obligation for them to make sure the debt is extinguished or the payment is, is no longer the consumer's responsibility. Um, and, and this is a commonly accepted exemption from this type of license. Okay, so the country. we wouldn't license them because they right. come under <coughs> contract law. Mm -hmm. If they don't pay my utility bill, I am by that contract not liable to pay Green Mountain Power. They are, and Green Mountain Power would have to go after them for payment. Right. They couldn't come back and go after me. Probably with, with um, your help. <laughs> with my help, yes. But, okay. Yeah. And this is a very common exemption. Um, as Because we're part of this um, national um, association, um, licensing regime. We speak with the other 50 states that are part of this, um, and all 50 states are part of this, particularly for the mortgage section after um, okay. the uh, 2009 um, mortgage crisis. Uh, the SAFE Act required that um, mortgage lenders, <laughs> mortgage originators be licensed. So we have this um, wonderful resource to be able to be in touch with all of the other states often. Um, okay. And that makes and it easier for as banks get more national and international and other 
to have one, if not identical, very similar licensing process. It's similar to the insurance industry where you're, you're getting the states are coming together, together yes. and recognizing <coughs> each other's the insurance is under threat of federal takeover. Yeah. Well, and, and some of and some of this has been too. And yeah, I think I the good it part be. is it standardizes a lot of the big common items, mm -hmm. but it still allows us to be very independent and have our state specific items, which we still do have and, and will hold out there where we feel it's important to and where the risks are. But this is one of the areas where, um, you know, the licensure may just be overburdensome to these companies that already have the obligation. Okay. And as just to reiterate, these are companies that are perhaps applying in 50 different states mm -hmm. with 50 different um, sets of rules, so we are trying to come together as a group of states to make it easier, or, or at least more consistent, for them to be licensed. Um, the, the, this is a little off topic, but um, there is, the OCC has taught uh, and has actually awarded license uh, charters to FinTech companies, which if they, if that catches on and there are some lawsuits happening, but if that happened, we believe a lot of the big companies that we are licensing will move to that rather than to a federal charter. charter. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and that would give them the ability to work in all 50 states without state control. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yes, okay. so ADP has set up a trust and they have just been awarded a, a charter. Um, so. It's in our mm -hmm. best interest. The ADP work. is the the payroll processing. Company. They are the payroll processing company. big company. Yeah. Okay, they must be. They do it all over the country. Yes, they, they do. do the jobs reports, don't they? Get the deer season. Uh, uh, okay. uh, some factors of that, I think. <coughs> yeah, I, I think, I think that's they're always later. referenced when the mm -hmm. new job numbers, unemployment yeah. numbers come. Mm -hmm. They're doing the payroll. They know how yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. checks they're writing. Okay. Then the last one on the, the light blue box is this um, sunsetting of the litigation funding report. So we have been asked kind of off kilter. Uh, we get an annual report from these kind of uh, companies every year. All these companies do a report. For and this is report. the, it's my money, <coughs> I want it now. People, they, there's a lawsuit involved. We'll pay you a certain amount of dollars. And, and I will, yeah, like, yeah, I will get. X percent of your award. Okay. Yes, and we are requesting that that not not the annual report. They will still have an annual report that we will monitor. But there was an extra report added when this um, bill was passed into statute. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. Not that long ago. Um, requiring us to do a, a study to do a separate report just on these companies, and we only have two. Um, okay. So we, you know, we have to spend quite a bit of time on two companies when we have 4,000 companies to worry about. So we'd like to sunset that in 2021. These are companies that pay a flat fee for settlement, or? Uh, no, if you if you have a lawsuit, they say uh, the potential for your lawsuit is $10,000. If you need the money now, we'll give you that money now. Uh, percent a on of that. for a portion of that. The, yeah. the amount we think you, that will get really settled. Because you may need the money to pay your lawyer to or do medical bills. or medical bills. Structured settlements. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So right. why is it so? What do you have to do that so onerous? And so, uh, just to clarify, so with these, it's a registration versus a license. When when the bill passed, it's a registration, right. so they have to report to us. And so, they file a report with us, just like all of our other licensees. But as opposed to all of the other companies that we supervise, we have to um, work with the attorney general's office and file a report with the legislature every year saying we have two companies, this is how Could many. Could you give us a copy of that um, report? Sure, we can. Sure. Yeah. And, the, and the odd thing is it, it's in October, so we, we monitor all the 
call reports that come in mm -hmm. during the beginning of the year, but it's this kind of one-off thing that we're doing for two companies. So we just like to change the date for consideration. <laughs> yeah. Or put it in or something. Else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it it, it could show up in um, the our uh, annual report that there are only two of them, and how many how many um, geologists are affected. Okay. So it is being reported, it's just not a separate yes, it's not a, it's a Any of us that are interested are welcome to go yeah. read the annual Right? What's, what are payday companies? Payday uh, uh, lender? Payday yeah. lender? We don't allow them. Go ahead. <laughs> um, we don't allow them in Vermont, okay, but they are, okay. um, in many states, they're permitted where. Um, perhaps I'm getting paid this Friday and I'm out of money so I can go to them and they can give me an advance of money with the agreement that I would go back when I get paid on Friday and pay them back. They usually charge a really high rate of interest right. because it's an unsecured and right. riskier loan generally to people with right. less than stellar credit. There was a lot of there was some some on the news just the other day. Yeah, there was a lot of abuse around like military bases and right. people shipping out and um, there is an issue with people with being able to cash. We also check cashers that charge. Mm -hmm. um, did we outlaw check cashers too? We license check cashers okay. under our yeah. money service businesses. So the licensees that are money service businesses in the state of Vermont can cash checks. We also have a separate license for check cashers, but generally speaking, um, it's the large grocery stores and Walmart mm -hmm. in the state that are our licensees for check cashing. And so they charge a fee to cash those checks because generally the financial institutions due to the Bank Secrecy Act requirements don't do that unless you're a customer or a member. Right. Madam Chairman, do we monitor on back to the payday loan thing, what's happening online with payday loans, things like that? You know, can you, I think there are programs that are nationwide, mm -hmm. you could get More online through <laughs> here, but those kinds of things, they're out of our control. When we get reports or complaints, then we will send them a letter to cease, okay. or cease and desist. Um, but due to the limitations of our time sure. and, yeah. and resources, uh, we haven't been able to proactively address that issue. I assume any mortgage done by Quicken, um, similar online, uh, has to meet the wrong standards. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. yes. I've, I've, I've done a few often, and it's never been an issue, and I've just always assumed that. Yeah. And I think that um, that brings up a, a reason why we want to really kind of look at moderni modernizing a little bit, really make easy this licensing regime, because it certainly seems to me that with what we charter and what we license, this is the fastest growing piece of um, financial services today online. Yeah. Any other questions about the licensing changes we've requested? We will have our drafter go through this line yeah. by line. Yes. <coughs> our struck out line. Yes. Well, I think that'll be uh, our attorney. It'll probably be Steve. Yeah. That's Steve. Da Steve. David. Oh, David's been David's been yeah. through and has you know as I said rewritten much of the language yeah. to modernize it. Um, David likes and I think that um, Steve Newsom from our office is going to do the line by line with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Steve is on for another day, right? It'll be next week. It'll, It'll be next week. week following okay. That's our next week here. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So one more little section. All right. um, these are the other changes within banking. Um, All right. We want to um, add some language about late fees. There used to be a federal yeah, rule right. that said that you had to, if you had a loan, you had to apply uh, to interest, principal, and then other fees like escrow, and the last would be late fees. That rule, uh, that federal statute was <coughs> repealed because of some other things in it, but that particular piece wasn't put back into place, so we want to make sure that we have that place here so that no one can get um, their loan um, 
listed as a delinquent because the late fees were taken first. Okay. We don't have instances of that, but we think this is a good, better safeguard. Safe 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 safe. safe. mm -hmm. We want to add some rules about advertising using a bank name. Um, we've had some instances last summer in particular where uh, information that is public was used to say that such and such a loan at um, a bank using the bank's name, we see that you have that and you need to call us. And it was somebody trying to sell mortgage life insurance, uh, a couple credit unions had that too. Okay. Um, and the bank had no idea or the credit union had not given permission for this. So we want to codify that this is false advertising and that we can do something about it and, and um, fine people or penalize them. Um, because if the way the statutes are right now, uh, that would be referred back to the AG's office and they have to go through the Postmaster General and find that and it becomes mail fraud. So we would like to make it clear that you have to talk to the bank if you want yeah. to use their name. Okay. Or the credit union. How does yeah. the, uh, the entity know that the person has a loan well, with the bank? It's public record after you file a mortgage. Mortgage oh, information okay. is public in, record. In land records over mm -hmm. here. Yep. Um, an hour in the clerk's office. Mm -hmm. The next one is another double reporting issue that we've had since the mortgage meltdown where um, if there's going to be a foreclosure, um, we have to be notified, we have to attest to the fact that we've been notified, and then the court is notified. But we also get all of the court records quarterly about foreclosures. So we have a way to monitor that, and we do look at that. But it's just this one extra step that's kind of left over from 2009, and we'd like to just have this that uh, you, they can go directly to the court, and then we will still get it. And we'll still get that from the court. They quarterly doesn't have to be signed. 22. Okay. Right. Um, the next one is just an update for a federal citation in uh, 1062. Um, the fed, uh, federal trade no. Truth and lending. I think it's, um, you know, like Section 23 was changed to Section 1023, but um, it's wrong in our statute, so it's just an updated citation. Technical check. Right. Yes, technical check. Um, just three more. <laughs> um, we would like to uh, remove the requirement for us to do a quarterly um, banking checking account that was originally designed for bank, basic banking. But all the banks have basic banking, um, which is part of their CRA uh, program, to show that they are looking out for uh, uh, people who don't want to spend a lot of money on a checking account. And all of them have gotten so complex that uh, they each want to have their own little thing to make it different. So uh, the, we, the report is not too long to make but it takes a lot of time calling the banks to remind them they have to do it poorly. We have a form that has to come out. And the report, which I do have one of those in here somewhere, is not very instructive and we don't have people who look at it. So we would just as soon spend time on some of these other more important risk issues. Okay, um, then that's we'll probably work no more Okay, and, and I, uh, we have, um, Copy of what gets put out, and it's okay. Yes, yeah. the Brock can read that. Okay, um, <laughs> we're going to change. <laughs> we can. We'd like to uh, offer a change to the land use tax lien program, which we know is also in the tax bill. But for uh, mortgagors, uh, this is important <coughs> that the land. Um, Woodland and farm land that has a conservancy gets a tax lien. The lien makes it difficult for that property to be sold in the secondary market. Um, the recommendation is that this be um, uh, deemed a contingent lien, which still protects uh, the lien of the, the property. Uh, this is a, 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 a land gains tax lien. No, no. Current, current use. use. Current use. Current use. Current use. Current okay. Use. Yeah. All and right. this this actually right. passed this passed last year, but it was in the budget bill, and then oh, and didn't then it went, make didn't it make through it in the final budget. Yes. Bill. Okay. So we looked at it before, yeah. but we have okay. it here for you. And mm -hmm. then the very Chairs last. And 
There are two chairs. And there's two chairs you can unfold. Um, we ask, the next to the last one, we, we ask that um, entities report to us any ATMs that they are opening. We have not asked them to tell us when they close them. So we have this long list of open ATMs that is incorrect. And in looking at our own record retention requirements, we can't take them off until we know they're closed. So we'd like to ask that people let us know when they close them so that when we do an exam, or for one, our records retention, when we go to look for them, that if they're not there, oh, okay, they were closed. So um, okay. it's a tiny thing, but it yeah. will just help our record keeping. And then the last is um, a no action letter which you might be familiar with, they have a no action letter in securities and insurance today, but we do not have this. Uh, this is when uh, we get a request saying, this is what our business plan is. Does this meet your standards and requirements? To do the legal work for that, uh, we'd like to charge a fee, a $250 fee, which is the same as insurance and um, securities. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we issue a letter saying we reviewed what you submitted, and if you do business based on what you submitted, we will not find a problem with uh, the business you're doing in Vermont. So we'd like to be able to do that. How many of those, how many of those do you issue a year? Um, we, we have to consider, uh, we already have had this year, last year we did 38 considerations for business models. Um, this year we've already, in two months, had 11, so we're on track to almost double what we did last year. And that's the reason for my saying this licensing is an area that's the fastest growing in our division. Um, I know it's not included in the bill you're going to look at, but we did already talk to Ways and Means about uh, the fee section and okay. House Commerce. Well, it, we will get you can, it's going in the fee bill? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we um, will get that. And the last change that we you will see in here is that, it, will it even show up in here? I don't know how your process is. So they stripped out the fee portion and our understanding is it comes back in? No, it is. It stays in the fee. Oh, okay. Because yeah. in okay. that we ask for a combination fee, uh, uh, combination fee, so, um, Chris very nicely had an uh, illustration where you can get your deer license and your fishing license together, so it's oh. cheaper than buying two licenses. So we have that for mortgages. We have about uh, 112 companies that have either, you know, they might have a mortgage broker and a mortgage servicer license. They have some yeah. combination right. in the mortgage realm, mm -hmm. and we'd like to be able to offer a com combination. A combination and charge a fee for Yes, instead less of than two separate fees. Yes, right. yes. Fifteen hundred dollars okay. versus uh, two thousand. Oh, okay. Not a lot, but put something. Yes. Okay. So that that is in the fee bill. Yes. All right. If it doesn't, let us know, and the fee bill will be. <laughs> okay. 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 And okay. that's my um, overview of chart. our. Thank you. It uh, makes something of that weight. Seem a little more manageable <laughs> with one week to go in county, so that's good. Thank right. you. And we I hope you enjoy all the lineouts in the middle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we, we started start noticing all the lineouts. We're getting good at that. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's quite a few. Great. It's very nice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, then, thank thank you. you very much for your time okay, well, and letting thank us you be your patience. Room. It's that time of year where floor time becomes <clears throat> unpredictable. We'll be back with a line by line. Okay, great. Especially the outs. We look forward to it. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. All right. We're going to go on to. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, we're not doing too badly. Um, we canceled the hemp last week because we got bogged down in cannabis. Mm. So it's back on today. Michael. Going to walk us through. This is another new one. I do not know what's in it. Um, so we'll find out. No telecom today, right? Uh, <laughs> no you almost killed Senator Sirach. He couldn't get through. At 5:30 last night, I was still having my ear bent. You were here. Most of us.
mostly because I didn't give him as much time as I gave the guy from satellites. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Goes with the territory, the extra salary. Though. And we need some smelling salts, though, because when Michael left, he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> dead center. Okay. No, we're not going to do that. We are not doing the 911 contract ever again. I have apologized profusely to Jeanette and kicked the ball across the hall. <laughs> And she was very happy to have Steve come over and talk about it. Oh, she was. <laughs> sure. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So, anyway. Tim? Tim? Only done that one other time. Well, that guy had been thrown out of another restraining order against him at the New York State Capitol. And he was my constituent, so we sent the bill over to GovOps, and Jim Condos was in charge. Mm -hmm. Figured he'd be less likely to be assaulted with Jim. I remember that guy. Yeah, he was a. That was over excess properties, the treasures. Yeah, we kicked it over. Should I begin? You can. Okay. We're back on safe territory. All right. So S fifty eight is an act um, relating to the state pen program. Um, Mike Grady with Legislative Council just for some background. The state has had a hemp program since in statute since 2007, but hemp during that time was listed by the federal government as a controlled substance and the Controlled Substances Act. In 2014, the federal farm bill authorized states to grow and cultivate hemp um, at, under pilot programs run by state agencies or universities. In 2018, the Farm Bill was amended again to remove hemp from the list of controlled substances and to authorize states to run programs regulating the cultivation and sale, actually it says the production of hemp and hemp products. This bill is intended to update the statute so that it no longer references those old laws, no longer references hemp being illegal under the Controlled Substances Act, and then brings the state program into conformance with the federal, the new federal farm bill, 2018 farm bill requirements. Part of what is being done is a registration requirement for those people who are going to grow, process, on-site process, or be a certified lab for testing, and they will pay a fee. That fee gets put into a special fund that is used by the agency to pay for personnel and to run the program. Okay, so on page one, You'll see a finding section in the chapter in Title VI, the agricultural title, um, related to hemp. There's a finding section about what the entire chapter is supposed to do. The first change is on page one, lines 12 through 15, striking out that reference to the 2014 Farm Bill pilot program authorization, and then striking out the, the reference to hemp being regulated under the Federal Controlled Substances Act. Uh, moving down on page one, lines 18 through 20, you'll see the purpose of, the, ch of the, the chapter is to establish policy and procedures for growing, processing, on-site processing, testing, and marketing hemp and hemp products. You then come to the definitions. There's a definition of grow, that people are going to be registered as growers, and they're planting, cultivating, harvesting, or drying of hemp, selling, storing, and transporting hemp grown by a grower. Then you get to the definition of hemp products. It's this, there is no definition of hemp products in the federal farm bill. They reference hemp products and say states can't impede the flow of hemp products in commerce, but they don't define what hemp products are. This is um, in consultation with Carrie Jaguar at the agency. This is the definition uh, we've come up with. It's all products with a federally defined THC concentration level for hemp derived from or made by processing hemp plants or plant parts that are prepared and formed available for commercial sale 
including cosmetics, personal care products, food intended for animal or human consumption, cloth, cordage, fiber, fuel, paint, paper, construction materials, plastic, and any product containing one or more hemp-derived CBD. So one of the things I want to reference is that it's the federally defined THC concentration level, which is currently um, 0.3 THC on a dry weight basis. There's been some speculation that there might be alternative tests that are allowed that will be, for example, wet testing the crop. So it's not on a dry weight basis. So if the feds, in their rules that they're required to adopt under the 2018 Farm Bill, authorize alternative methods or authorize alternate THC levels, you don't have to go back in and amend mm -hmm. the bill again. It's just what's federally authorized as the THC level. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, forgive my ignorance. What is the criteria by which it's set to that point three? That is the definition in the Farm Bill. Oh, that's, that's it. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> No. The, the gorilla has spoken. Right. <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. Okay. Um, page three is that definition of hemp. It's it's cannabis, which you just talked about on the floor and any part, um, including the seeds and all derivatives, extracts, cannabinoids, acid, salts, isomers, and salts of isomers, whether growing or not, with that federally defined THC level. And it shall be considered an ag commodity, which you will see later on in the bill as well. There's a definition of on-site process. It's where growing hemp and processing hemp or hemp products at the location where the hemp is grown, provided that no more, that more than 50% of the hemp or hemp products processed at the location shall be grown at the registered location. So some farmers or growers, I should say, might be processing at a site and they can take in some hemp from other growers and process it at their site, but if they're going to be an on-site processor, then they have to produce 50% or more of their product. And that plays into the fee a little later on. Um, there's a definition of process, storing, drying, trimming, handling, etc. Um, I'm turning hemp into a hemp product. And those are the definitions. Then on page four, line three, section 563, this is where hemp is declared an ag product in the statute and it's just referencing the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, page four, line 10, uh, section 564, this is really the meat of the bill, the state hemp program. You're striking on line 11 the reference to the pilot project. You're adding the fact that there's going to be an application for the registration. And then you can skip to page 6. You'll see on line 4 that the secretary is directed to establish a state hemp program for growing, processing, on-site processing, testing, and marketing of hemp and hemp products. You'll see on page six, line eight, that a person who wants to do any of those activities, grow, process, on-site process, et cetera, needs to apply to the secretary uh, for reg to register. The application shall be accompanied by a fee. The application or renewal form um, is gonna be provided by the agency and it has to, and it's going to require certain information depending on what you're applying for registration for. So you need the name, an address, your contact information, whether the person is applying to grow, process, on-site process, or test. For a grower, the federal farm bill requires that there be a legal description of the land where the hemp is going to be grown. So you need to provide the location and acreage of all parcels where hemp will be grown. And you need a statement that the seeds used are below the T are meeting the federally defined THC level. For a processor, you need to give the agency the site of the processing location. And this is all a fed requirement? Well, for the cultivator, the, anyone who's growing, well, yes, yeah. yes. The and, seed. Yeah, and the seed is also it's as well. Okay. Um, for a person applying as an on-site process, right, so as an on-site, you have to give everything you need to give as a grower, and then you have to give a statement that 
50% or more <coughs> of what you're going to process is from the on-site cultivation. Um, and then for a person applying to be a testing lab, you have to give the location of the testing lab and any certification of that lab that the secretary may require. Um, the secretary on page 7, line 19, is authorized to verify that information that is provided and request additional information if necessary in order to do the review of the application. On page 8, line 3 through 12, the secretary is authorized to deny a registration if the applicant doesn't provide the information requested, fails to submit the fee, fails to submit the additional information, or does not meet the requirements under the federal farm bill. And there are things like if you're up down, if you have negligently violated the THC levels um, over a course of time, if you have with an intent other than negligent intent, and I don't really know what that means, um, <laughs> are, in, uh, are, are cultivating THC, cultivating hemp with a, with a THC um, in excess of 0.3 in number of times over a course of years, you are prohibited from registering in the program under the federal Okay, farm. so you, I guess I've heard that last year we did some work on this somewhere. You did. You yeah. brought it up to the 2014 pilot project. Okay. Right. That sometimes I remember the joking about you couldn't burn it. Um, that sometimes well, you burn it, but it the, no, the hemp sometimes some of the plants will come in with a higher TH. They cross over into marijuana. Right. And we had a process for destroying or... Right, so technically when a hemp was on the controlled substances list, when you had that, that crop, that crossover 0.3, you no longer had hemp, you had marijuana, right? And now you're a farmer with a burned <coughs> load of marijuana. Very that, popular with the neighbors. Right, which is still, at that amount, Criminal, right? Yes. So, and federally criminal as well. So what you did last year is you said if your your crop is under one in THC, that you have some alternatives. You can contract with the dispensary to separate out the THC and to return the crop to you or otherwise dispose of it. Um, and so basically giving that farmer alternatives other than burn your crop, and by the way, you might be a criminal. Yeah. <laughs> right? But if your crop now comes in three years in a row or two out of three years, right. we're going to start being a little... You, you may not participate in the program. Okay. So a hemp producer that negligently violates the state of tribal plan three times in a five-year period shall be ineligible to produce hemp for a period of five years beginning on the date of the third violation. So get a new seed provided. Right. Okay, right. Okay. And then if you have a culpable <coughs> mental state greater than negligence, what do that mean? I didn't know negligence was a culpable mental state in the beginning with. Um, Only a lawyer could have written. Then, oh, yeah. You lose a lot of money when you're that much. A lot of a couple of the middle states. <laughs> um, then you have you the state agency, the attorney general, etc. It's a felony, um, and any person convicted of a felony related to a controlled substance um, shall be ineligible during the ten-year period. Okay, that was my. If you've been caught dealing. Right. Not just an ounce, but a trunk full. Yeah. Those are from the federal, federal law? law? That's from the federal law. What page are you on right now? I'm, I'm mm -hmm. reading the federal oh, law. Okay. It's not. Okay. What we've done is just said, hey, you've got to comply with the federal requirements right. instead of putting a culpable mental state greater than negligence right. into state law. This, this you refuse is, to do that. Okay, so Congress did that. Congress did that. Yeah. That answers it. All right. Um, 
So on page 8, line 13 to 15, a person registered may purchase or import hemp genetics from a state that's also federally compliant. Um, page 8, line 16, a person registered with the secretary under the program is subject to inspection by the agency of ag. That is a federal requirement for your program. Uh, but on page 9, one of the things that the Senate committee was, the ag committee was discussing was yes, the, the agency needs to know where the location is, where the parcels are, that's required by the federal law. But maybe we don't want everyone else to know exactly where hemp is being grown. We've had some theft issues. So the name and general location of a person registered with the agency will be public, but any specific information about the location of that field, its coordinates, its tax ID number, etc., that will not be available to the public. Sounds like uh, title drains to me. Why do we want to know the general location of anybody? So if you want to know where, where a lab is set up, if you want to know where an on-site processor is, the agency wants to know that. But it says on the right, person but, register. Right, and so the public, do you want to know where the marijuana grower is in South Carolina? So that was the committee. Know. Okay. The, so that was the committee's dis discussion that there should be some general knowledge, but not uh, information about the location of the field. So Happy Smoke Farm is registered as a hemp grower. <laughs> Did you say Happy Smoke yeah. Farm? But they've got two hundred acres. They're growing corn on 150 on it. Right. What's not going to be public is where on that 200 acres, the 50 acres of hemp yes. are located. Yes, exactly. And it's about the scarecrow. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> or the deer. Um, probably, yeah, because there have been, there were news stories last year about major theft. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was amazed at the value placed well, on that's, one that's, plant. Well, that's part of it. The flowers, when they're <coughs> they are valuable. I guess my question is, why is it of the person rather than the operation? What if I live in Charlotte and I have a piece of land in Middlesex? So what well, good does it know if someone would know where I live? The default definition of person pretty much includes every kind of legal entity that you can think of. Corporation, limited liability corporation. I mean, it's, it's, it's everything. Since you don't live on the land in Middlesex, it might be much more prone to clear cutting in your absence. You might not like Citizens United, but the General Assembly has defined a person as a corporation. Yeah. And the corporation could be registered in Wyndham County. Yes. And that's the general location of the corporation, but its operation might be in Washington County. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So what we're after is the location of the business? Is that what you, we're after here? That is what would be, you get the agency under the federal farm bill is required to get information about the site of the parcel where the hemp is grown, right? right? So the, the agency, agency knows. The agency will have that information. But if they receive a public records request about who is, is cultivating marijuana, cannabis, hemp in, under the program in South Burlington, they would say these people are registered as growers and this is the site of their business, but they don't provide the site where the fields are. They don't provide information regarding the cultivation of the hemp. The agency knows. Is this this has gone through agriculture already? Yes. Yeah. But the, this is not a, they don't have a committee bill, we're gonna do a committee bill, is that the idea? No, no. This this is is a a this is a so referred here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just this is us. Is so, there's rulemaking authority that the agency already has. You're amending that to give them authority to require um, to have requirements for testing or different types of testing. On page 10, they're also going to have rulemaking authority to require labels or label information on hemp products. Um, and then you get to your, your 
section, page 10, line 10, the registration fees. So a person applying to grow, but only to grow hemp or seed grain, fiber, or textile, has a $100 registration. For a person applying to grow for floral material production and viable seed or cannabinoids, um, they have a fee based on acreage, and you'll see that on page 11. If they have less than 0.5 acres, they pay $50. If they have 0.5 to 9.9 .9 acres, they have paid $250. If they have 10 to 50 acres, they pay $500. And if they have greater than 50 acres, they pay a $1,500 fee. People who process, page 11, line 6 and 7, they pay a $1,500 fee. People who are a lab pay a $1,500 fee. People who are an on-site processor, so they are growing and processing, they pay twice the amount of what they would have paid if they were just applying as a grower. So if they have 0.5 to 9.9 .9 acres, they pay $500, and they don't pay the $1,500 that a processor would pay. Sorry, I, are these fees consistent or do they come out of something else that Ag and Twitter Markets does or mm. what sort of generated the conversation about these numbers? Um, they were originally, some of the numbers were originally proposed by the agency, but for example, the on-site processor fee, that was purely the recommendation of the committee. Okay, my just base question is, <coughs> 0.5, 9.9, all right. How many plants go into a seven, eight acre, and what's the what's the value of the crop that that's going in there? Do we know? Um, if uh, I, I'm not the person really to ask. Uh, that yeah, no. I, I I mean that's just a question. I I don't know if the ag agency can do that. I. Just know that the Ag Committee is inclined to cut farmers a good deal. And I <laughs> want to make sure that the people yeah. of the state of Vermont also are sharing in this new prosperity. Well, as with any fee, I think this fee is designed from the agency's proposal to fund the program. Okay. So I, I don't believe it's. Uh, I give a give a farmer a deal day, um, which I have that button on my keyboard because I'm, uh, um, I'm only kidding. And, and the hobby started. Sorry, um, But it's my understanding that this is going into that special fund to pay for the cost of the program. Okay, and, and I think that's what I want to make sure is that it's adequate and that it is. In right. If there's a, if it's worth ten million dollars and we're only getting a fifty dollar fee. Yeah. <coughs> well, I'm just yeah, thinking we're trying to fund a abuse prevention and a couple other things, and okay. this may not be the fee to look at. But. On page eleven, line fifteen, if you decide after you've registered that you want to grow more, you first have to inform the secretary and pay the additional registration fee. Okay. Um, and then on page 12, you'll see the special fund. Um, it's administered by the agency. It receives appropriations or revenues that you want to appropriate to it, and then it receives all the registration fees. And then on page 12, line 11 through 15, you'll see that it's used for the cost of personnel, program administration, testing, and other costs incurred by the agency in running the program. There's no renewal fees yet? The, the, it's the same. It's the uh, application and renewal. Every year? Yep, annual fee. Annual. Okay. okay. So, what makes this a program? What does the agency do other than register people? Um, they provide a lot of service to, to the people that are, that are cultivating and processing. Um, they're going to be um, helping with, in my opinion, navigating some of the federal requirements for some of the hemp products. Um, for example, the federal farm bill in 2018 said, hey, it's no longer a controlled substance, but by the way, 
the Food and Drug Act applies to drugs and food, and, and then there's a separate act for supplements, and the <coughs> FDA's authority still applies. So... What is this? Supplement? Food? Drug? What is it? Supplements. Supplements. Right. You and can so make your dog I mean, less nervous. It's on TV. I mean, my son uses it. When you're holding a product out for its medicinal benefits and that product is used in or on your body, that's a drug. And FDA needs to approve that. And so um, that's something that, that processors and people making products are going to have to navigate. They, do they do that now? I mean, don't they sell CBD oils and... A lot of places around. But remember, it used to be a controlled substance, and just like those states with legalized marijuana, the feds just weren't enforcing. Okay. Right? But yeah, the I federal farm bill says the FDA is now has jurisdiction over those products because it's no longer a controlled substance. Okay. And they have, the FDA has asserted that they, they will assert jurisdiction. There was a rate where a whole bunch of things were confiscated. In and that, Maine. Yeah. In where? But they weren't, yeah, they weren't FDA approved. CBD oils and mm -hmm. oh. products. But that product, there is a process there? There's going to be a process I mean technically there already is a process because you it's if you're going to register as a drug you can register as a drug right but that FDA needs to approve it and so far I think they've only approved one two two products the CBD in it as as a drug as a drug which means it has no one of them is the seizure right uh, yes. yeah is that it? I know last year we just said we weren't going to we weren't going to require state approval because it was our little girl that was going to Colorado to stop the seizures four times a day. Okay. Um, then we don't. Talking about industrial things, and then they're talking about uh, products that are like food. Is, is that? Is there a separation in the law between hemp that's used for clothing and cannabis and rugs and rope? The one separation is where when you are applying for registration, if you are just growing for, for food fiber or seed and not for the CBD flower or CBD product, then you pay a lower registration fee. Otherwise, there's no difference. You're not processing, you're not going to be a processor, you're just going to cut it down. Right, and you're just growing sure. for that. Drying is processing. Well, like, drying is processing and growing. If you're drying and you're the grower, that, that's that's Then I, I'm also a processor. Right. Right. No, we're no. defined grow. Grow is drying. To include drying okay. by the grower. Okay. Right. That so, makes more sense. Right. So, you, because it's just part of the, the, the process of, of harvest, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. So, re and retail is just sales tax. Pardon me. Retail is just sales tax. Products are sold retail. Uh, that that is not addressed in this bill. Oh, we don't pay tax sales tax on like over the counter drugs, do we? Not if they're drugs, you don't. Not if they're close. Well, how about nutritional supplements you don't pay sales tax on, I don't think. I think you do. I think you do on nutritional supplements. No, like remember the whole fight over like a chore and oh, stuff okay. like that? Oh, oh, oh kind of. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big fight, fight for vitamins. And I, I, mean, I remember oh, Peter, that. I remember that. I, I remember the Peter Griffin was counsel. I remember the fight. I don't remember the outcome. <laughs> I don't either. I, don't I think Janet wanted to tax them. And she okay. Like, it was on the table a few years ago. There was a whole yeah. street of items in the sales right. tax. Mm -hmm. right. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Okay. So, well, I, I think we'll probably. So, do we have any, any, anything to compare this with? I mean, the fees are the most important thing to this committee, but is there any other? 
Uh, and there are other schools. We've got a hand in the. There are other states point. that are setting up their programs with with different fee structures. Okay. okay. There are any the education the fees will cover the cost. Is that it? Uh, that is my um, understanding that that's why the agency proposed these fees at these levels. Okay. So, agency, do you want to talk to us? I was curious to hear what you said that. that was quite good. Offer we did multi state comparisons of fees, and this puts us lower middle. Um, and the fees were designed to cover in the end two positions to run the program. Okay, okay. so Mr. Rockton, I can see your brain. No, no, I just I think we should do something. Because it's so new mm -hmm. to, to review it or sunset it or something to make sure we revisit it in a couple of years, whatever we decide. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully the fees will get on. We used to do it every three years mm -hmm. until the fees got right. stopped. And I think some of us are hoping we get back on that three year schedule so that we do review them and they do cover the cost, at least. Yeah. Carrie, do you hear again? So these fees originally were in this bill. They were proposed by the agency in the fee bill. The House mm -hmm. has seen them and changed them. You're seeing the reflected fees, so you will see them again, and they will be part of our our fee bill in the future. Okay. So we will get to look at fees. We usually do. So we okay. changed a, a definition from hemp products and moved things like seeds and seed oil and uh, over to on the next section. Page two, page two. Well, didn't seeds used to be I have no clue, that's why. That's I don't know. Um, seeds are under hemp, right? Well they, they changed pages on definitions from the from the bottom of uh, eighteen on page two, they disappear and then they show back up again. on page three, line four. Right, you're moving them from hemp products to hemp. So a seed is really hemp, it's not a hemp product, right? A rope but that's just a matter of definition, not a matter of science. Yeah, well, if you squeeze the seed and make, uh, we'll so it, it's also conforming with the definition of hemp under the federal law, because under the federal law, it means a plant, cannabis, sativa, and any part of that plant, including the seeds thereof. All right, so it's partly driven by by the feds. So processing these, page 14, I'm sorry, page 3, line 14. Storing, drying, cleaning, handling, compounding, converting. Wait, where are you? Page three, three. Line three. Okay, you're on line fourteen. So if you if you try and store it, you treat it like hay. If you're trimming it, what are you doing? Cutting off the, the good parts or the fat? Threshing. Where is separating it? seeds from no I, separating seeds from the from the rest of the special here. Um, you know, I think that would probably involve the handling. Okay. Great. And we probably, if you want, we could get somebody that does do this in to talk to us <coughs> about how it would that work? I think I tried. I don't know much about healthcare and all this stuff. I know a little bit about farming and when it's sure. a farming thing, I'm trying to get my head around. Well, that's what I'm saying. Maybe we can get a farmer so to, speak. to talk to us about how these okay. different processes work um, and how it goes from being a plant to a medicine um, and, or other so things. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. We got one more bill, which we 
walked through before, and it turned out to be more simple than the. This is the tax expenditure carbon, which turned out to be a study of how we might incorporate. businesses either intent or present practice of limiting carbon admissions to part of I think the evaluation process uh, is part of the evaluation process for the tax credit it's a study so this is studying a carbon tax Credit. It's for tax credits, right? Yes. Yeah, so, and, 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 excuse me. Um, it's a uh, uh, tax and JFO do a biannual report on tax expenditures. And this would be basically come back with a report on are there criteria that can be used to evaluate the carbon impact of Vermont's business tax credits? And is there some way to incorporate that into the existing report for the year? And so does this include things like the veggie program that's not tax credit exactly, it's more of a Yeah, it's, it's in there, it's a tax expenditure. Is it, is, yeah, I'm not sure if veggie is. I'm saying whether it would fall under this or not. Um, we'll ask, we'll I mean, ask we'll Ryan. Copy the report. I think it could be particularly complicated. For example, I just think about tax expenditures. Uh, we've got a tax expenditure in which we don't charge a sales tax on locomotives. Now, what that would suggest is that we then do an evaluation of how much carbon a locomotive emits. And then we have a similar credit on, 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 on uh, ferries. Yeah. And then we, I mean, this it could become a monster in terms of just the labor associated with calculating this. I can see old coal we basically be reviewing what? Every, every tax expenditure that's a business, that winds up being a business tax credit. I mean, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting my head around it. I, I Did say. Somebody was figured there's real money here. No, I don't think, no, this is Senator Lyons. I don't think she figures there's real Did money Did she do here. a walk? She did come in. Yeah, she yes. came in. Yeah. It was on this, right? And said, yeah, you know, she's in. just trying to figure out a way, when we're trying to reduce That's emissions, nice. if there's a way to evaluate your car, you know, like your, you're not, part of what you're building is not an uninsulated, thing. but I believe we have up the building code, so you can't do that anymore. There was a concern for quite a while that some of these big box stores just put up tin roofs and left, cranked up the heat and let the heat go out, and we did, I'm quite sure, do some insulation and building code standards there. We can check that. When she was here, it sounded easy. Her description it sounded <laughs> well, pretty. I thought, she, would, I thought then, she had the solution in the bill, and that right. had me a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we should, it's, this was Senator yeah. Lyons is a really short bill. We should at least hear from the people who are to be responsible. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, basically, who's going to do this and what's how, what, how the joint fiscal yeah. labor intensity of doing it right. is, is what my Okay, well, maybe that. we will ask Graham to come in and or yeah. Steve Klein and talk to us That's about it. That's a good idea. Yeah, so, so let's see if somebody from joint fiscal will come talk to us. Okay. So, you said we should easy. just rent the credits without studying them because it takes too much trouble to study them? Or? No, it might be easiest. I mean, I can see, you know, Steve Klein. You know, measuring the exhaust out of every locomotive that we give her credit for. But we want locomotives now. <laughs> there was yes, a time exactly. where we didn't, but now. Like locomotive with a long cord. That's. Right. Right. We need some more locomotives. Oh, locomotives. Are I mean, I appreciate what she's trying to get at. Yeah. Yes. From a yeah. diesel yeah. engine that's in the yeah. locomotive. Yes. So would you You're credit right. one and tax the other? I don't know. I, I, I think, you know, it, she has a fiscal note on it's this. an interesting yeah. idea how it works out in practicality. Mm -hmm. And 
how much effort it would take. You know, there's a cost benefit going on here, and are there things I would rather have joint fiscal measure? Mm -hmm. I mean, you could say just grossly that there would be an adverse uh, impact on some things, but how much that is and how you measure it, and then it's still, you know, a judgment case is the, the, the reason that you're giving the, the, the tax, you're making the tax expenditure, does it still offset the amount of the, I'm not sure what the object of this is. I think the object is to, in simple terms, to, to reward companies that are not clean, green exactly, companies. that are not contributing to global climate, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, these are. Well, when it comes to subsidizing other behaviors with tax revenues because they are equally as useful. We go, my goodness, we can't spend that kind of money. Where what are, you, what are you thinking of, Mark? But Pardon? Then, what are you thinking of? What kind oh, of? if you wanted to send everybody that had an you know, electric car or yeah. right, you know, so much dollars, so many dollars oh, so for reducing, mm -hmm. reducing carbon right. and, um, and say, well, that's a great idea. It, would, you know, it makes yeah. a lot of sense. We don't have the money to do that. Right. And then if someone else is mm -hmm. buying a locomotive or something, or, or doing something in their yeah. process yeah. that it's saves, good. we go, hey, well, it's easy. We can pay for it with a credit. Well, right. Even the dollar amount is the same and the carbon amount of savings is the same. Right. It's a double standard. Actually, we probably should do away with the tax credit for locomotives. Well, you could argue well, you that, that you know, the, the locomotive actually reduces carbon because uh, every wrong. time you use a locomotive, you avoid using 18 wheels. 200 trucks. Yeah. And, and so right. who's going to do that calculation? Well, that would already be yeah. meaningful because it's on well, a large it, I mean, scale. The, the, the question is, do we have the expertise yeah. to even start to do yeah. that? Yeah. Um, okay. We made it on time. <laughs>